We have more motorized toys around here than you would think to stick at. <laughs> Close the window too. Oh, okay. All right. Who are you? I am. I guess speak loud enough. The microphones are picking up there. I am legally Edward Frank Longden. <laughs> Normally goes by the name of Frank. All the criminals know you as Frank, huh? Yes. Now, Frank. Uh, Notorious throughout North Jersey, etc. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to ask who I am because no. it'll get real ugly. Uh, when were you? Uh, when were you born, Frank? Uh, March the twenty seventh, the year of our Lord one thousand nine hundred twenty nine. Twenty nine. Yeah. And what? Where, when were you in? Uh, you were in the service. In which service? And during which uh, conflicts? I was in the service in the United States Air Force from 1948 to 1952. And I was in Korea from 1950 to 1952. The conflict in Korea started, I believe, on June the 25th. And I cruised... And what year was that? 1950. And I cruised into Yokohama Harbor on June the 27th. So I was right behind the North Koreans. And now, you went into Yokohama Harbor on a was, ship? Yes, that was the debarkation point. And then we were assigned from there and went our merry way. So you weren't assigned to a squadron before that? No. They, my assignment was to go to Johnson Air Force Base up outside of Tokyo and join the 13th Bomb Squadron of the 3rd Bomb Group, 3rd Bomb Wing. And when I got there, they had already, they were on maneuvers when the war started and never did get back to Johnson. So they took us and made us a, uh, a party and armed us, gave us helmets and all the rest of the good stuff and put us on an ammo, ammo train and we were to guard the ammunition train going down to southern Japan to Iwakuni, which... We kept the presence in Iwakuni for just about the whole length of the war. Uh, originally, that was our base. Uh, when the war started, we were on maneuvers in Ishia. Two days later, we moved up to Iwakuni. The 13th had the distinction, if you will, of losing the first Air Force casualties of the Korean War. They uh, managed to get back with battle damage. And unfortunately, in the course of trying to make an emergency landing, banked into the dead engine and fell off on the wing and went into the ocean. Now, what type of aircraft were those? Did it fly? Uh, they were originally known as A-26s at the end of the Second World War, but because the Martin 8 B-26 was put out of service, they redesignated the Douglas to be the B-26, and an excellent platform it was, though it was still a prop-driven aircraft. It had, uh, my specialty being armament, we were uh, entrusted with the B model, which were all what they call hard nose. It had a, either six 50 caliber or eight 50 caliber machine guns in the nose, three in each wing, and either one or two turrets, upper and lower, or just an upper, that all worked simultaneously from one gunner's compartment with a periscope sight. To explain how the twin turrets worked, they rotated on an azimuth together and there was a fire interrupter that allowed the lower turret to fire when you were below the level and the upper turret would cut in if you went oh, above wow. the level. Okay. But, uh, so you just you track a target with the telescope and yeah. the system switches guns? Yeah, periscope also switched your sight from top to bottom. But because your, your, your uh, azimuth remained the same, it was negligible whether you were up or down. You didn't see it in the sight, but you knew it from the right. sound of the turrets. And, uh, now, were you an airman? What was your rate right, right rank? I was armorer gunner and eventually became the line chief for the armament section which was about 40 men, and uh, we did all the maintenance, troubleshooting, assembling and loading of all the bombs, the rockets, the aircraft, machine guns, and ammunition, and it was uh, 
a rather formidable job. We would carry as much weight in the bomb bay that a B-17 carried in the Second World War. And that gave us the opportunity for a variety of loads under the wings externally. Two 110-gallon tanks of napalm plus eight five-inch high-velocity rockets or four 500-pound bombs or a variety of things, cluster bombs. And, uh, we uh, would occasionally form two, team, two aircraft in a hunter-killer configuration. One would carry uh, flares under the wing and would go in and drop a flare and the second would follow in under the flare because we became exclusively night hunters. And if there's anything that would give you some food for thought, think of an aircraft that in a combat attitude will do 300 miles an hour, flat out it will do close to 400. Uh, going in the pitch of night in between a mountainous terrain. It's very interesting. <laughs> The only thing that, that gave you any point of reference at all was to try and find a valley while we were fairly familiar with the areas after a while. You would find a valley and get down low enough so you could use the top of the mountain as a reference point against the sky. Wow. Other than that, you looked down from high and you saw nothing but black. So it became extremely interesting. Now, as an armorer, so you would fly the missions with the air crew? Yes. But I had no, I had no set schedule. If I had a, a returning aircraft, or the AC, or the pilot, if you will, uh, would say to me that uh, <clears throat> my guns didn't fire, or I wasn't able to fire my rockets, and I very diplomatically asked him about the switch positions, and he would <laughs> inform me in no uncertain terms that he knew the switches and they were all on. So I would say to him, when are you flying again, sir? And he would give me his next schedule, and I said, I will replace your gunner, sir, and I will fly with you. And, and these are all your planes. I mean, yeah, you're responsible for sure. the weapons. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so that generally, uh, generally speaking, that took care of any further discussion on switch position or the availability of the armament as it's installed. And once in a great while, we would find a, a malfunction, but every time we cleared an, air for, an aircraft that returned, we would pick up troubles right off the bat. Number one, if they couldn't expend an external bomb load, they would be hanging on the wing, so it would be perfectly obvious something Do would... they normally land with bombs if they couldn't get rid of them? Sure. They also had, uh, you know, you, you have characters, and the 13th was famous for characters. No. Yes. Believe it or not, including their armament chief. <laughs> they, uh, there's terms they use for pussycats, pilots, and tigers. And the 13th Bomb Squadron was made up of nothing but tigers. And I tell you, the stories I could tell you are unbelievable. <laughs> Old Trees Martin was a second lieutenant made captain, and twice he brought back aircraft with tree limbs in the leading edge of the wind. <laughs> and one was in the summertime, I remember in the summer all the doors were open because we didn't have air conditioning. <clears throat> and we were sitting around waiting for returning aircraft and we saw Martin going in the, the orderly room and the old man was in there and we heard the old man call him into the office. Well the old man was quite a character. And now what was his name? Colonel King. God rest his soul. He died in combat. But be that as it may, that's another story. He got in there and we could hear him reaming good old Martin out. And he finally got to the point where he said, Lieutenant, did you go to, to briefing? And he said, yes, sir. And he said, in what area were you? Purple 19, sir. What was your mission? Low level, close support. Then why the hell didn't you fly under that tree? <laughs> <laughs> and that was the kind of the way things went in the 13th. That's why we were known as the Devil's Own Grim Reapers. And now, Martin now, is that the official name, Frank? Yes. I guess if you go through the annals of history within the Air Force and the Air Corps before that, going back to the formation coming out of the Lafayette Escadrille in World War I, 
June 14, 1917, the 103rd Aero Squadron, which became, almost immediately became, the 13th Aero Squadron, and that was our derivation. And that was when we picked up our skeleton with the side called Oscar, and that is the heraldic history of the squadron insignia. There's a round patch on a navy blue background with the white skeleton with uh, a yellow side with red, obviously, blood on the, on the mm -hmm. blade of the side. And it changed, there are something like 18 variations between World War I and what is now presently on the reactivated 13th. It's gone back to the simple round circle of navy blue background with Oscar in the middle of it. But uh, during World War I, it changed. After World War I, it changed. World War II, all variations. We are in the process, the association is in the process of making a collection of all the variations in the various aircraft that they use them on, which should prove to be a fantastic thing. It's going to be a present to the brand new reinstituted squadron's commander when we go to... Uh, Nashville this uh, this October, but to get back to uh, uh, obviously my pride in the squadron is never ending, and that's that's a common bond with all the fellows that ever were members of the 13th during combat conditions. Many of our senior pilots at the beginning of the Korean conflict were guys that stayed in the service and were with the 13th in the Second World War. And as soon as Korea started, they put up for transfers and came right back to the 13th. So as you went, as you, now why did you go into the Air Force? How old were you and what were you, what were you doing? Why, why did you go into the service? Uh, at the time, 1948, we still had an active draft. And uh, I was 1A. And I was kind of footloose and fancy free. And what was 1A for that was the first people called up to go in the draft. Young, single, healthy. Yeah, you got it. Well, I had had a, uh, I, my, part of my misspent youth, I raced motorcycles. <laughs> and I cracked up and broke my leg and all kinds of good things. So I was waiting to get into the telephone company. And they kept telling me that my leg was no longer spec and I couldn't get on hooks and climb poles so they couldn't take me. But they would wait if my doctor said there would be some recovery involved. So we went through that. They hung on to me for quite a while. And I thought, gee, you know, if I'm in that bad a shape, why am I sitting here 1A in the draft? Why don't I go enlist and when they reject me because I have a non-spec leg, then I can get reclassified and not worry about the draft. The only thing wrong with that logic was <laughs> the Air Force, <laughs> which I picked at random more or less. I liked flying, so that was not surprising. Uh, their physical requirements were different than those of the telephone company. <laughs> when I was protesting that I was still in this group that was about to be sworn in, the response I got from the man in charge was, Please be quiet and raise your right hand. <laughs> so that was how I got in the Air Force. So that was the story of that. And where did and where did you go to boot camp? Uh, San Antonio, Texas, 13 weeks. From there I took a leave, then I went back to Denver, Colorado for armament school. I had a stint in uh, the ordnance uh, outfit down in uh, Maryland. And I went to a survival school, also out in, uh, partly in Colorado, partly in Texas. About how much time of school did you have from the time you went to boot camp until you deployed? Um, from October until just about a year, just about the next October, September, October. And what was it like with all these World War II veterans around? Because you were just the green kid. Uh, and just a lot like of these veterans were pretty much, they yeah. just came back from World War II. Just about what you'd expect, a green kid that, uh, you know, got kind of pushed from pillar to post, but 
I, uh, I rolled with the punches and learned along the way. And pretty soon, like anybody else, after you're there a while, I don't know whether they get used to you or sick of you, but they accept you. So I got accepted after a while, and uh, I was with uh, the 94th bomb in California. And I thought, well, okay, now I've seen all this, let me... Uh, was that your first unit? Actually, I was in the 301st in Kansas, but that was, the government came in and closed Smoky Hill Air Force Base, so that was the end of that. I shipped down, went over to the 94th in California, Merced Castlefield. And I thought, you know, this, there's got to be more excitement than this. So I volunteered for an overseas stint. And they this said, is before the Korean War started. Yeah, this is like, uh, well, maybe very early 1950. And uh, I said, oh, good, I'm going to go to Alaska. So I volunteered to ship out and go to Alaska. And uh, orders finally came in. I was going to go to Japan. So, you know, you say, well, that's close. It's on the same planet. So I went home on leave and I came back got squared away and got on board a vessel and off I went to Japan. And uh, of course being at sea is nothing new to me. I was born and raised down at the shore in summertime anyway and was a saltwater fisherman and all that kind of good stuff. But it was funny, we had a, we shipped out in a great big three stacker, which is like a doggone luxury liner. It's huge. Was that a Liberty ship? I mean, were these no, the ones no. all used in World War II to no, transport this, troops? This was a troop transport uh, maintained by the MSTS Military Sea Transport Service. Right. Uh, but it was a big, beautiful thing. Second day out, everybody is seasick and stayed that way for days. I could never figure that out. And the Pacific was just as calm as can be. It was wonderful. I couldn't understand what was wrong with these people. I thought later, in retrospect, coming home, instead of flying home, I had some connections in Forest Air Force headquarters. So I talked to a friend and I said, I don't want to fly home. I want to take a nice casual trip home on board a vessel. So they put me on an old cattle boat and I was thrilled. <laughs> and home we came and I mean it was stormy. This is after you came back. This is when I'm coming home. It's stormy. I can see the, the bubble on the hull. It's pitching and rolling so much. I don't remember anybody being seasick. <laughs> I've thought about that ever since. And I thought, gee, that's amazing. They're leaving home and they get sick and it doesn't matter about the weather. They're coming home and nothing could make them sick. <laughs> but, you know, that's human nature. What are you going to do? Now, what did you, how long did it take you to get over to Japan? Gee, I don't know. 13 days? Does that sound logical? Was, I it, don't, was, it, I mean, was it boring? Was it, what were you doing during that whole time? Uh, this may come as a surprise to you, but I volunteered to be part of special services on board the vessel, and I played the clarinet, and I made like a comedian on the shows on the ship. Can you believe that? No, I find it very hard to believe. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> goes to show you where their taste was. <laughs> Anyway, it was a very enjoyable trip. I had a grand time. Uh, as a member of special services, I was allowed to get over into the cabin class passages. And we had a contingent of wax going over, too. So that made for a much more enjoyable trip than if I was stuck down in the hole with a bunch of smelly GIs. Now, at that point, you were single when you left. Oh, I certainly was. And so Came back the same way. 21? Uh, 22? About yeah, probably uh, close, maybe twenty. So now you, so then you got to Japan, and immediately got sent up to Johnson, and then of course the war had started. We were all in a tizzy, and I took this ammo train down to Iwakuni and was assigned to armament, understandably. And uh, it was uh, it was very interesting. We were assigned to barracks and a bunk and all those kind of good things and we went out in the flight line and started working on the aircraft and to the best of my knowledge I guess for the first month we never left the flight line. If we wanted to eat, somebody go in a weapons carrier, pick up some food at the mess hall and bring it back out to the flight line. And uh, now what were you hearing on the political side? Was Korea's invade, North Korea's invaded South Korea? Oh yeah, we were getting our tail kicked. 
big time. So they wanted all the help they could get. And uh, I went over on an advance party to Tegu, which was the outer edge of the Pusan perimeter. And uh, it was very interesting. The 49th fighter had F-80s on the Tegu airstrip, which happened to be the corrugated steel stuff that the engineers lay down. Mm -hmm. Boy, is that tough on tires. That uh, they would take off, pick up their gear, and start firing. That's, that's how, close. That's how close the front line was. Now, what were you doing there? They didn't have room for our 26s. So we established what amounted to a forward uh, base for rearm and refuel. So they would fly out of Iwakuni, fly a mission which took about four and a half hours. When they left their target area, they would come to Tegu, come in, refuel, rearm, change their, fix anything that was wrong. And then they'd fly another mission and wind up going back to Iwakuni. And then go home after the... Yeah. And uh, as I say, there was, uh, the crew situation was really kind of a merry-go-round. If somebody got sick or got wounded, they pulled them off, and whoever could be spared out of an advanced party just got on and flew the other half of the mission, which I did many times. And uh, then the unfortunate part of it was you really couldn't stay in Iwakuni because you were needed back in Tegu, K2 as they called it. So we'd have to stick around, get back in and get on another trip, get another mission, and then the drop one off. One mission so you can be brought back. <laughs> so it got, it got pretty hairy, but uh, we had a bunch of guys, honest to God, they wouldn't care if they had to fly down a barrel of a 75, they'd do it and smile. And they'd raise hell right up until they got it. It was unreal. Now were these, these mostly the pilots or the air crew, is it the same? The, team concept. I mean, it, was it really team, felt like it was a team concept. Yeah, there was everybody was in the thirteenth, and we had a mission to do, and that was, uh, you know, God, country, and family—not necessarily in that order, but pretty near. Mm -hmm. And you just went and you did your thing. And you did it to, as long as you had a breath. You just kept moving. And you and you said and you said that what was the name of that forward base? K two. K two. Yeah, K two. Now were you, so that was pretty close to the front lines. That was. You had the about, fighter wing there. Yeah, we had a couple of fighter wings. They were stationed there because they didn't take up as much room as we did. Mm -hmm. So they stayed and we just kind of processed in and out. We did that for quite a while. Then uh, the end of uh, 50, we had pushed them on up. Just now, give me a time there. reference, so you've been there for yeah, how long? This is where I'm going to have difficulty, because remembering the time all ran together. No, I mean, just how long were you over there? A uh, year now? I mean, just so I have a reference. Uh, I spent a total of two years in Korea, okay. from the beginning of the war until 1952. So you're at Tegu for how long? Uh, maybe... I'd say six months, but it was longer than that only because... The Chinese came in and shoved us back down the peninsula again, so where we had planned on moving up a couple of, uh, we had a small contingent up in Taejeon, and they stayed for a short while, but then they lost that because the, the Chinese were coming down, they had to get the hell out of there. So I stayed in Taegu for quite a while until we went up the second time, and then we established the base in Kunsan, and that was our permanent base for the rest of the war. Well, at Taegu, and you were there, and the tide turned. I mean, yeah, we started was... pushing them back. And then the Chinese, what, what was, what's the scuttlebutt? What's the discussion around the base when the Chinese come into the war? That was a very tense time because MacArthur made it very clear that he wanted to cross the river and keep going. And there was a lot of mixed emotion. Obviously, we were all regulars. So whatever the word was, that's what we did. Right. Yeah, this was not a democratic organization. This was the military the way it should be and the way I wish the hell it was today again. But uh, the people, they have to understand that is an absolute necessity if you're going to be effective in a military sense. You can't have a democracy in a military. You have to have well-trained officers, you have to have well-trained enlisted men, 
and you have to have people instilled with the team concept that says the mission is number one, come what may. And what's the order of the day is ultimately going to be what's best for the country, and that flag is only next to the Holy Grail. And people in this country have to understand that what that flag represents is the heart and soul and the guts of every veteran that ever served in a conflict. And now, did you get that feeling when you were there, when you were working with the 13th? Yes. But more importantly, let me, let me digress to some degree on a personal note. How do you survive in a combat situation and do your job effectively when there's all kinds of crap going on around you? The ultimate result was a very, very painful experience for me personally because I think I became a very good soldier, the generic term for a military person. The first time I was in combat, I got the living crap scared out of me. They often say a mission is three hours of boredom and 20 minutes of sheer terror, and that's probably about pretty close to accurate. But, you know, you have to perform, and you have to be able to perform properly in order to get your mission accomplished. So what does that mean? That means that psychologically you cannot, quote-unquote, panic. A complete and total panic means you can't function. You can't think, and you don't react. A panic is you're useless. You might as well shoot yourself. But what happens is you get conditioned. And when you start to get conditioned, you don't realize, I didn't realize it. But because I became good, I was being made good by the fact that I psychologically was being devoid of emotion. Think about that. I would laugh and I would kid around and I would go get a little bit drunk and have a good time and I'd work my butt off and I'd be so tired I wouldn't be able to stand up. All outside false surface emotion. Inside, I felt nothing. I could blow a hole in somebody's head and step over the body and never bother me a bit. Yet, when I came home, I just, that's when it really hit me. When I tried to become a civilian, I didn't relate at all. I couldn't understand the emotions of the civilian population until somebody explained to me that I was recovering from a complete uh, void of all emotion. And to this day, I can't go to a movie because the pendulum swung the other way. Now I see a kid crying, I'm ready to cry. I go to a movie, I can't see a movie. I'll be crying in five minutes and cry the whole way. You think comedies? <laughs> no, I could probably take a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody always throws something in the, in the plot that will screw me up. Now, now, what helped you through that? What helped you when I don't you know. came back? Well... Uh, I think what helped me get safely into that state of mind, which ultimately obviously makes your chances of survival so much more because you're working very efficiently. Uh, I had a terrible accident in Iwakuni. I was back when we were using the Major Omaha base. That's the Japanese base. Yeah. I was there and we had a mission come back. And a young fella, Eddie Martin, 18-year-old kid, good kid. He came over there with you? No, he was part of my armament section, but he was in Iwakuni. And we were teamed up one night clearing the aircraft when they came back from mission. You had to take them out to a clearing area, clear all the guns because they're all hot. Mm -hmm. And you can't park them like that. Somebody can throw a switch and hit the trigger. Right. And boom, away we go. So... Uh, we found that some of the guns had malfunctioned, had not fired. Well, they had an electric solenoid on the, on the side of the weapon that fires from the switch in the cockpit. Mm -hmm. So once we examined them and find out that the plunger's not out, we had to find out what the cause. So I said to the kid, uh, it was misty out, and there was a canvas cover over the cockpit. So I just pushed it down enough to be able to open the top of the cockpit and jump in, but it was still across the windshield. And we have a 6x6 six six backed up to the nose so we can clear the nose guns, and then I would go up and clear the wing guns. 
So I told him, we're going to have to clear the guns and then we'll check the firing circuit. Okay. I said, I'll do the wing, you do the nose. Okay. I went up and cleared the wings. Jumped down the cockpit, yelled clear. Now, is it clear out the barrel? You're clearing the rounds out the barrel? No. You hit the, uh, the uh, manual charger. We have air chargers on the guns. And you hit the air charger after you remove the belt, and it charges itself one time and kicks the live round out. Now it's empty. So you're not clearing out the barrel. You're clearing out of the, uh, out of the out chamber. Out of the chamber, right. So I cleared the wing guns and jumped back down, and I yelled clear. And uh, the engineer down below yelled clear, and Eddie yelled clear. So I hit the trigger and I heard a click. So, all right, so I jumped up and I checked my said, okay, one gun here, one gun there, was it fire? I said, all right, you clearing the nose? I'll try the nose. He said, yeah, go ahead. I jumped back down the cockpit, turned the switches on, and unbeknownst to me, Eddie stayed on this side, walked right across the front of the back plane to get to the other side. I pulled the trigger and he only cleared one side. 450 calibers from about two feet. Holy shit. Boom the hell. And how old were you then? 20. I mean, you just got there? Yeah. 20 years old. Whew. That was a toughie. But, you know, life goes on. So that puts you into where you say you were devoid of, I mean, yeah. for the rest of the war. Yep. That puts your body and mind in a state of... Well, that, that, I think that's what started it. And then, of course, the longer you're in combat, the more you get immune to mm -hmm. the stuff that goes on around you. Because, uh, well, one night, for example, we came back and I went to help the navigator out who had been hit and got him out and got him out of there. And I went to, to throw some rags and paper. Frank, can, can you explain something to me? Because yeah. out of pure ignorance on my side. So a plane comes back into where? Into K2 or Tagu? It doesn't matter where it is. Whether it's but it comes K2. in. And now we have to put it in a separate area where it's away from everything. Until we no, I'm it. talking about the navigator. So they oh. land. He just pulls over in the parking area, the clearing area. And one of the guys is hit. Yeah. Okay. So they bring an ambulance over and a couple of guys to get the guy out of the cockpit. He's unconscious. So there's blood and crap all over the place. So I'm in there trying to clean the cockpit up a little bit and uh, find a piece of his jawbone and took that out and sent it out with one of the guys to take back up to the hospital and uh, I don't know what ever happened to him. It, it, there's so much going on you can't just track things down like you, when somebody gets hurt here in an accident you follow them to the hospital and right. you don't. It's gone, it's gone. You hope that you get some information back later on. And if the guy's hurt bad he's not going to stay there, they're going to fly him back to Japan or well, that was, I told you that I got a tape from Jimmy D. Polici today. Yeah. It was one of the things off of Okinawa that he said he could not get out of his mind was that they just put the sailors over the side. Yeah. They, they couldn't bring them home. They just, they were dead. They, and they, you know, um, I suppose it sounds pretty terrible, but one of the things that further illustrates the mental condition you get in, I was on a reclamation detail. I took off a couple of weeks to help. When we were moving up north, way first time out. So what is uh, a reclamation detail? Uh, a representative from each of the services forms a group, and they go up in areas where they discover munitions. Okay. Either captured enemy munitions, or in many cases, expended munitions of our own. And our job as the reclamation detail is to identify them. Are they reusable? Can they be uh, salvaged, or do they have to be blown up on the spot? And if so, almost like an EOD team would do. Yeah, right. And uh, when we were up there, we went up to uh, we got up. Everything the line was moving rapidly at that point. That was when we pushed them right up to the yellow. And in Weijambu, I think that was the place. We uh, we got a call to come over to a specific area. We went over there. And as I recall, there were 23, the name 23 pops in my head, there were 23 of our GIs in a ring with their hands tied behind their back with wire, all shot in the head, killed. And they had a bowl of rice in front of them. 
I looked at that scene and without even thinking, you know, I, I said to the, the uh, Navy chief, I said, you know, these are the luckiest guys in the war. Because when they were running like that, they only do that because they can't take prisoners. They'll kill them. But they were lucky. The guys that were taken prisoner went through hell. Really? They were never going to be right. Well, I shouldn't say that. I've met a couple of my own guys since then, and they seem okay. From the 13th? Yeah. In the beginning, they wouldn't take 13th prisoners. We had we had a, a gal on the radio, radio, whatever frequency it was that we listened to in the barracks. And this gal would come on every night. This is right in the very beginning. They nicknamed her Soul City Sue. Uh, what, Berlin Annie during the Second World right. War or something? Tokyo like Rose. Yeah, right. Same thing. And uh, they used to boy, they used to call the 13th all kinds of murderers. And, and they they said flat out on the radio they would never take prisoners of the 13th. And they never did. Up until very late in the game. So, uh, so if they went down, they were just executed? Well, you tried to get in a position where you could call. If you were, a lot of the times our transit area would be out on the coast. So you could get down, like if you had to bail out, you could bail out and get down next to the coast and maybe find a cave to get into and you'd have a small radio. And they would send a chopper or they would send a boat in from a submarine mm -hmm. to pick you up if they could establish coordinates on where you were and all that kind of good thing. We had several pretty exciting rescues like that. Some of our guys that I see now at the reunions, and holy crow, I thought you were gone away. <laughs> yeah, I was, but I came back. And they gonna Just to bother you, Frank. Yeah, holy <laughs> mackerel, I thought And by the way, the gun did jam. Yeah. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> oh, man, oh, man, I'm telling you. Oh, it's funny. Some of the stories, though, are really funny. We hit a marshalling yard back in the days, and we did close, uh, daylight close, uh, low-level close support. And we hit a, a railroad marshalling yard. Oh man, that well, was. What is a marshalling yard? Where all the trains come together and form different trains. Oh, so the North Koreans. A Korea's million tracks country. all over the place. Oh man, for a B 26, that is just gravy. I mean, you can go in there, you go down that doggone thing with all those 14 firing 50s going. It looks like a great big bulldozer doing 200 mile an hour, 300 mile an hour. Stuff is flying in all directions. Talk about a weird... Now, where would you be on that? Would you be on the telescope? On the periscope? On the periscope? It depended. I may be, or if it looked like it was wide open field day, I could look out the window and coordinate hand and eye. Oh, really? Without using it. Yeah, because we used all armor-piercing incendiary bullets. Mm -hmm. So there were no tracers, so nobody could say, see from the tracer where, it, where it came from, but when it hit, the high explosive would make a flash, and of course the armor piercer would just keep right on going. Right. But it was great because you saw all these little pinpoints of light so you knew where you were hitting, mm -hmm. and they couldn't tell exactly where it was coming from. So that was great, but uh, one of the phenomenas, phenomenon mm -hmm. of aerial combat, we were doing a martial yard one night, one day. And uh, where I was having a field day, and I forget the name of the pilot I was with, but he was good. We were probably only about 50 feet off the deck, and coming down and uh, racking, racking some uh, box cars, and there was a guy on running down the top of the box car, and I hit him, and he flew up in the air, and I swear that I looked him right in the eye when he died, and he, before he fell. And I thought, you know, I could never tell that story because nobody would ever believe it. One of our navigators on a trip up to the Yalu said he had the identical experience with a guy in a tank. As they peeled off from their mission, the guy had his, had came up out of the tank and he was all bloody and he swore he had eye contact and the guy died and fell over in the, out of the turret of the tank. <laughs> I said, well, I guess I'm not nuts. I guess yeah, that does happen. Yeah, weird. You know, uh, no one in my generation, as we talked earlier, has been in your situation. So when someone says, yeah, I can imagine that, 
You couldn't imagine. No. You know, because it's... And you think, how can you possibly have eye contact with somebody? You're doing 300 miles an hour, and this guy is, what, doing, you know, standing there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you ever flew low over an airport, it's amazing the things you can see. And yet it's all done inside. Your mind is project. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes the quickest thing in the world seems like slow motion. Especially if you're going to die. Yeah. <laughs> that takes a long time. But anyway, that didn't happen. So, so tell, me, tell me a little bit about the guys. Oh, they were great. They were fantastic. You know, you, you always get the, the, the tough stories at night. When we were in Iwakuni, it was the strangest war I could ever imagine. We were in Japan, which was not at war with anybody. We're using their airstrip and their facilities, mm -hmm. but, you know, this is not a wartime situation in Iwakuni. It's fun and games time. I had rented a house in Iwakuni. It was great. You came to work. This was after things settled down a while, like in, uh, uh, I guess, late 51, beginning of 52. After being over there a year? Uh, well, I was 52, made it two years. But it was before I came home. Uh, well, at the end of 51, I guess, it settled down to a point where things were pretty much of a, a scheduled routine. And like when I was in Iwakuni, we would fly a mission, you take off, you go, you know, you show up in the base, you live, you could live any place you wanted to, you live in my rented house, go in and eat, you know, I have a young lady cook my food and everything, it was nice, not, nice. not a bad deal, you know. And then, she wake you up in the morning, you got to get a uniform on, go to the base, get all set, now you're going to fly a mission, get your tail shot off, and if you live through it, you came back and came back, you know, that night was dinner ready, hon? <laughs> I mean, unbelievable, what a, what a crazy, crazy thing, and I, I remember one night, this guy Bob Smiley was a good friend of mine, and uh, we frequently flew wing for one another. And uh, he got shot down one day, which was kind of tough because it was one of those things apparently some ground fire got him as he was leaving the target area. Friendly fire? Uh, no, it was, it was enemy fire, but in the position he was in, he shouldn't have gotten hit, but he did. You know, he can't tell a bullet to go the other way. Oh, is he a pilot? Is he a No, he was armor? a gunner. He was a gunner. And uh, he was just a gunner. He came out with the crew and was assigned. We, uh, we were, we were kind of freewheeling. So uh, anyway, he got it, and it was a verified KIA because he was done. They saw the plane go in and blew up and all that good stuff. So at that night going into town, who do I run into but his girlfriend? And she's all broken up, you know. So she came over to my house and spent the night while we were kind of con consoled each other about poor Bob not coming home. Weird. I mean, talk about a very strange lifestyle. Well, and, and you look at, you know, you talked about the emotions and, you know, how you do it. And you can understand it was a because perfect you're not living example. in a real world. Yeah. That was, you know, that was just surface emotion. It didn't, you know, there was right. leave in the morning, so long, take care of yourself, see you around. So whatever happened to the tree guy? Oh, he picked, he did that twice. And one time, the... the I guess it was the, the first time, uh, or was it the second I, guess, I don't remember which time it was, he warped the wing. So we had to scrap the airplane. And we couldn't get parts, we couldn't get airplanes, we couldn't get nothing. I spent two weeks over in Benoit in Vietnam as a quote-unquote advisor. They had just gotten 50 brand spanking new B-26s. The Vietnamese or the Americans? No, the, the, the French Foreign Legion that was oh, in okay. Vietnam at the time. And, uh, you know, that was a painful thing to go through. We're over there with Tennessee National Guard, Ohio National Guard, still painting on our aircraft when we could get them, and replacement parts for Trevor. True and Gum and Bellawai was the hour, it was the order of the day. Yeah, we kept those suckers going. We had an aircraft called Abel. I got the picture hanging on the wall. 287. It, uh, it had 17 missions on from the Second World War, and it was still flying with us. 
that they had well over 200 missions in Korea and was still flying in here. I think the only thing original was the fuselage. The tail had been replaced, the wings had been replaced, the flaps had been replaced several times. And it still kept flying. We wanted to have that put in the Smithsonian, but I read in one of our newsletters, I read where somebody tracked it down. It had been taken out of service, sold to South America, had been used for, for a while, I guess the CIA used it. Then they sold it to uh, some South American government who used it for some of their big wigs and then some uh, mining company or somebody was using it. And it's sitting on the edge of a runway down in Venezuela or someplace down there. And the latest thing they wanted to get, see how much they could raise from the membership Get the darn thing resurrected and brought back up here as a memorial. And it would have been great because that plane was, that was an icon. They just couldn't kill it. That was something. That was the versatile lady. And boy, she had no Zark and it knock your hat off. We had a visit from the Assistant Secretary of Defense one day over in uh, K-8 in Kunsan. And she arrives in her blue staff car with her jodfers and her leather boots. Rosenberg, her name was. Uh, the old man, Belson, at the time, had everybody go out and he says, gets a hold of Brooks, who was the artist. He says, hey, Earl, put a bra on that bra anyway or something. And so we got this lady coming from the defense department. <laughs> so, so Brooks goes out with watercolor. <laughs> Don't use oil on that one, baby. Don't water that. You're coming right off again. He goes out, he puts a bra on her. She gets out. Oh, she was a riot. I was up in the nose of that thing with my fanny face in the moon while I'm trying to get the last cleaned up before she arrives. And she was there, and I didn't know it. And she comes up with her head. Her head was between my legs, and my fanny's pointing at the sky. And I looked down and his little face is there and she says, so that's how it's done, aren't you arguing? That almost fell the hell off the nose. <laughs> and she turns to, to Belser and she gives him an elbow in the gut and she says, you didn't have to put a bra on her for me. <laughs> she was a pistol. Oh, jeez, that was so funny. Now, who is Brooks? Uh, Earl Brooks was our, he was a gunner. He was, he worked in the uh, Photoshop. And he wanted to fly, so he qualified as gunner, and they made him a gunner. Uh, I see he's, he's with the association. He was an excellent artist. Oh, he was fantastic. So every one of the planes had nose art on them? Uh, most of all, yeah. We had, you want to see a Spirit of Core, I got a picture, a silhouette of an eight-gun nose parked on an airstrip. And they have blast tubes. The guns themselves are inside of a blast tube. It's supposed to cut down on the on the light so it doesn't destroy the pilot's night vision okay. when they go off. The bottom two blast tubes on an eight gun nose, they got two, 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 two. The bottom two had bayonets welded on the blast tubes. <laughs> this is low level flying, let me tell you. <laughs> The edge trimmers for that oh, tree guy. Man. Well, listen, that was the way the squatter was. That was, that was, that was it. That uh, with the, uh, with the blue background, that's the new one. That's from the new squatter. I get a close-up shot of that as you're talking. So can you tell me or remember any of the uh, the other guys that were... Uh... Oh, we, I could tell you stories about guys coming back from missions and some of the crazy things that happened. We had a guy from Texas who was a gunner by the name of Pac. The guy was built like a doggone linebacker. He was big. He was tough, too. And he came back from a mission, and he was all upset. Man, he couldn't grab a beer fast enough. I said, Pac, what the heck's the matter with you? This guy was generally pretty cool. He said, I just had the worst mission of my life. I said, what happened? He said, well, we come into this railroad yard, we got a train. He said, uh, he, I think he was flying with Plotnik, who was a real pistol himself, stood about 6'7". He said, we popped a, 
uh, a rocket in a tunnel and block the train from escaping. He said, we're down there racking away. He said, we peel off, we see a sidetrack, and here's a guy and a kid going like hell in a handcar. So he said, we peel around, and as I watch, the guy jumps off the handcar and heads for the field, leaves the kid on the handcar. So he said, I thought, you dirty old man. I swung around and blast. I almost emptied one turret on him, and I couldn't get him. Somebody said to him, hey, Pat, what would you have done if you had hit him? The kid would still be alone. Jeez, he said, I never thought of that. <laughs> so you're that close, you can actually see what you're hitting oh, yeah. when you're doing ground. In the daytime. At night, in the night, the only advantage was you could get a better idea of where uh, the return fire was coming from. But they, you learn, and you'd be surprised at things you learn. You learn to go down a, 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 a valley and work the valley over, and then you learn where, by silhouette, where the end of the valley is, and, the, and you go around the mountain, and you come back down the valley again. Only when you go behind the mountain, now these people on the ground are not dumb either. They know the tactic. When you get around the back, you go like this with your throttles and you throw your engines out of sync. Knocks the sound to hell. They can't figure out what direction it's coming from. <laughs> so you come around the other side and they're still looking, where do you go, where do you go? And there you go, here I am. And these, guys, and these were prop planes? Yeah, R2800 Pratt Whitney. The thing would fly on one. It did that more than once. I went into uh, Kempo one time as an emergency landing because we were going to try and make it back to base, but we, uh, the one engine was out. So we managed to get in okay. But before we landed, once again, the navigator was wounded, and my compartment was pretty well shot up, but I, as far as I know, I wasn't hurt. So the old man was taking inventory, and he says, I don't know, he said, the oil pressure not too good. He said, you want to get out and walk, I'll flatten out and give you a chance. I said, what are you going to do? He said, I can't leave. He says, I forget who the, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember the navigator's name. He said, he can't get out. And I said, hey, if you're staying, I'm staying. So, okay, we managed to make it to Kempo when we got in there. So we're walking away, we're walking across the field to somebody's Jeep or truck or whatever. <laughs> The old man starts chuckling. He says, what the hell are you laughing at? He says, you want to see the back of your chute? <laughs> see what? The back of my chute. It was all torn up from flack. Oh. <laughs> if I'd have gotten out and walked, it would have been a fast, long step. I said, oh, jeez. Well, goes to show you. So you that's had all... That's what I got for wearing a back chute. We weren't supposed to have backpacks on when in the garbage compartment because there wasn't room. We wear a chest pack, and then once we got in, we take the damn thing off and hang it on the wall anyway. But it was interesting. <laughs> Did you ever have to bail out? No. No, I walked away from two, and they were both uneventful, aside from a little bumping and thumping. Mm -hmm. The other one was when, in 50, when we were running, no, it was 51, early 51. We were coming back down, and we were moving down just about as fast as we moved up. We had to leave a lot of equipment behind. And that particular mission, we, uh, we were up there destroying our own munitions we left behind so the enemy couldn't use them. And we got hit again, and we had to drop it in a rice paddy. And we got out of there, and we were right next to the, turned out to be the uh, first cab tank battalion. And uh, we, uh, they got in a command jeep and got ferried out of there, and uh, I stayed to destroy the aircraft. So uh, I got a hold of the command tank and asked what they had. I suppose they had some RDX or C4 or something like that, and I had been to ordnance school. So I borrowed some explosives and some wires and proceeded to... Uh, Get in the airplane because the batteries were still on, and <laughs> said to the guy in the tank, Don't go away now, just stay there. <laughs> I cranked up the turret and emptied the turret back to wherever wherever somebody was supposed to be. I emptied the turret because they, they couldn't use that either. And then I jumped on the tank and said, Just go easy, and played out the wire. I said, Okay, hold it. 
We're in a plane, we said, let's get out of here. So now why was there a plane on the ground? Because we could no longer fly. We had lost an engine and we had to go down. Oh, okay, it was so a we, broken plane. Yeah, we dropped it in a rice paddy. Oh, okay. That's why I say, the crew, the, uh, the pilot and the navigator went with the command jeep, but I stayed in order to destroy the airplane. Once again, we're moving south quickly, and we didn't want to leave them anything. Right, right. Yeah, so. Uh, so, hey, tell me that story. I ran into a guy from home there, too. He was in a, was in a type of town. I stayed with him for a couple of days. He was from he where? Patterson. Grew up together. Went to high school together. Just halfway around the world, in yeah. a rice paddy in Korea? Oh, well, I got another guy. I went up, I found out where he was, and I went up and uh, spent a week with him. See, being a, the line chief, I could pretty well call my own shots. So hold that in front of you. Let me, uh, let me adjust this and I'll zoom in on him. So keep telling I me, mean, tell me who this well, guy is. This, this is a buddy that I grew up with We from childhood. We went to grammar school and high school together and had worked together and we were like, in fact, as kids, we cut our wrists and exchanged. Now, uh, who's who? Uh, that's the big guy is me with the Thompson. <laughs> and the other one is Howie, my buddy, who has since met an untimely demise. So he was in the Army? Yeah, and I found out where he was, so... I jumped off a mission up in Kimpo and jumped on a C-47 and went down to some Iraq hospital and they loaned me a jeep and a driver and they took me down to his outfit and I stayed with him for a week. Went on patrol with him and we got into a firefight and his squad leader got wounded. And now what was his full name? And Howie Bristow, B-R-I-S-T-O-W. And he was in the Army from Patterson, New Jersey? Yep. What else you got there in your pictures? That's funny. That's <laughs> oh, these are three of my guys. Let's see, three, yeah. three of my guys at the uh, 1998 down in Virginia at one of the reunions, and I didn't. I was supposed to be there, and I couldn't make it. And who are they? Do you know them by name? Ah, uh, let's see. They got Victor Renault. Uh, and he was in the 13th with you? Yeah, he was in armament. And uh, Aaron Platt. Okay, move the finger. I got him good. Platt was my tent mate in Korea. He's a sweetheart. And what was he, an armor? Yeah, he was originally in the turret shop. But when I left, I left him in charge as line chief just until a new guy came in. And who's the third guy? Joe Plesbert. He was a character. He was one of my armorers. Good guy. And this was the 98 reunion. In 99, we were going to meet again, and I was going to make that one. Joe died one month before the reunion. That was a real, that was a shame. We were real good buddies. I have a picture somewhere before I left Japan with, uh, I'm surprised that McCrite's not in that one. I guess that's it. We talk about, oh, I got a couple of newspaper articles, wow. This is a discharge from the New Jersey State Guard for 1945. I was only, I was only 15 years old and my brother was, had been in the Navy and I was damned that this war was going to stop without me at least getting my feet wet. So I went down. This is from World War II. Yeah. So I went down and I got into the State Guard with a phony driver's license to substantiate my age. And then I went to Fort Dix on their two-week training. And I transferred over to the 113th Division Regular Army and went to their basic training. At 15. Yeah. And I came home from basic and... Uh, went to my buddy's house and changed into civvies. And when my father thought I was working at a camp up here. <laughs> and he just happened to go down to my buddy's house to talk to his father. And he looks in the closet and he sees this uniform. And he says, oh, is Sonny home? Because he had a, a son that was in the Air Force. And the guy says, so no, that's Frank's. 
He said, who Frank? Your son Frank. What are you talking about? Yeah, he came home from basic and left his uniform here. Now, was that between the end in Germany and yeah. the end of Japan? Yeah. <laughs> so the next thing I know, I'm being called out on the company street to please report to the orderly room. I report to the orderly room, and there stood my father, and I almost had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> Two days later, I was discharged, and that's my discharge. They transferred me back to the New Jersey State Guard, so there was no bull crap about who was going to take the blame for this screw-up. And then they discharged me from the New Jersey National Guard. Jimmy DePolisi went into the Merchant Marine at 15, yeah. paid a guy $10 to sign his name, his <laughs> father's name. Yeah. Hey, did, so, hey, Frank, tell me that tell me that story you were telling me earlier about the uh, when you took some leave. I mean, just kind of your perceptions. Understanding it was only five years after the atom bomb went off in Japan mm. that you were there, you know, on the way to Korea. Some of the things that were very upsetting, uh, realizing that it was still fresh in a lot of people's mind, the Second World War and the terrible Japanese. Anybody is subject to their government. When you have a war, people have no choice but to do as they're told, otherwise they lose the war. So the Japanese fought the way they were taught to fight. The Americans did the same. The Americans wound up winning the war. That doesn't mean that every Japanese is a no good Jap and they're all this kind of crap. That, that's false. And to find people coming over five years after the war is over that never saw a day's combat, had no reason to harbor that kind of deep-seated hatred which I believe is real in some of the veterans' minds, and I don't deny that. Mm -hmm. But to have somebody that was not there pick this up because this is the thing to do. This is the attitude to have. Baloney! How are you ever going to try and heal and carry on if you're going to keep this deep-seated hatred over something that you had nothing to do with? Right. And as a result, I, I if there was anything that I had that got me close to being in a little trouble now and then with disagreements with our own guys, it was that attitude. I said, you know, if somebody comes down and kicks you in the shins, you got all the right in the world to punch him in the mouth. But if all he's doing is bowing and saying good afternoon, why are you going to kick him in the shins? He didn't do anything to you.